Okay, let's start. Welcome everyone at the last uh, parallel session at this great conference. And we'll start with a uh, talk by Naoki Sasakura from Kyoto University, uh, Tensor Eigenvalue Distributions Through Field Theoretical Methods. So the floor is yours for the next uh, 15 minutes, including a discussion. And uh, today I'd like to talk about tensor eigenvalue distributions uh, you by using field theoretical methods. And uh, yeah, this work is based on these papers. Okay. Mm. Ah. Not working. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. And uh, let me start with an uh, introduction and uh, so, um, as you may know, eigenvalue distributions of matrix models play important roles in understanding atoms, two-dimensional quantum gravity, QCD, etc. And um, the most famous work in this subject would be the semicircle law by Wigner. And uh, so, um, the natural question would be the, uh, what roles eigenvalue vector distributions can take in tensor models. And, uh, 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 Actually, um, tensor eigenvalue vector distributions were previously studied uh, in these papers. Uh, in these two papers, uh, the exponential numbers of uh, real tensor eigenvalues uh, were computed. And uh, in this paper, the estimation of the largest eigenvalue in the large end limit was um, uh, given. And also, uh, in this paper, an extension of regular semicircle law was uh, proposed. And uh, um, actually, uh, the real tensor eigenvalue distribution is the same problem as to count the critical points of the Hamiltonian, which is uh, often called complexity of the spherical spin model for spin glasses. Uh, actually, this has uh, comprehensively been solved uh, by a matrix model techniques in this paper. It's uh, about 10 years ago already. And uh, so therefore, uh, the end results of this talk are not actually new. But however, uh, the uh, method we use is different, um, namely field theoretical uh, method. Uh, so therefore, um, uh, we can expect uh, um, the method will give some insights and extensions different from the previous studies. And uh, this will be uh, mentioned briefly at the summary. And uh, um, so let me start with uh, what are the tensor eigenvalues, vec uh, eigenvalues and vectors. So um, um, in this talk, I um, uh, restrict myself to uh, consider only a real symmetric order three tensor, CABC, and uh, this large n denotes the range of the indices. And uh, then the tensor eigenvalue vectors of uh, uh, tensor C is defined by this equation. Here, theta is the eigenvalue, and v is the eigenvector. And uh, uh, there exist some differences from the matrix case. Um, for example, um, the, uh, the eigenvalue um, problem is, uh, uh, in the matrix case, uh, the, this problem is a linear equation. But uh, here, in this uh, tensor case, a system of n nonlinear equations. And also, uh, as you can see easily, um, this uh, equation is scale invariant. So therefore, uh, the, the definition here is not unique. And you have to uh, properly uh, gauge fix uh, this ambiguity. And also, um, uh, in the matrix case, a symmetric uh, uh, real matrix has only real and, uh, real, and real uh, eigenvectors. But uh, um, um, in this uh, tensor case, um, uh, they are not necessarily real. Uh, therefore, um, because of these uh, differences and complications, uh, there are some different notions of eigenvalues and vectors. Uh, the uh, relevant uh, notion in this uh, talk is what is called Z eigenvalue. In this case, the uh, eigenvector and the eigenvalues are all, um, both real. And uh, this uh, ambiguity is fixed by, the, uh, by normalizing the eigenvector. And uh, uh, in this talk, uh, the purpose of this talk is to compute the distributions of real eigenvectors and, uh, and eigenvalues. 
So the uh, setup is that um, C is, as I said, symmetric real tensor of order three, and uh, it is uh, assumed to be uh, Gauss has Gaussian distribution. Uh, so, uh, so uh, first I consider this uh, equation, which is uh, real eigenvector, uh, which determines the eigenvector distribution uh, when the uh, C dis is distributed by uh, uh, Gaussian. And uh, um, here the, uh, the item value is uh, fixed to be one. And then uh, one can transform this the information of the distribution to the information of the real item value distribution. Here the uh, uh, item vector is normalized. And uh, then the uh, item value is given by the inverse of the uh, size of the vector V. And uh, so uh, as I said, uh, what is new in this talk is not the end results but the, uh, the fact that we use field theoretical method instead of matrix model. Now let me define uh, what is eigenvector distributions. So let me consider a certain C. Then the uh, distribution of, uh, the eigenvector distribution is given by just by the summation of the uh, delta functions located at the uh, solution of the eigenvector. Because the eigenvector satisfies this equation, so therefore uh, this summation is uh, nothing but just the uh, delta function of the equation itself. But uh, because of the uh, difference of the major, uh, you have to uh, uh, correct this ma major difference by introducing the Jacobian here. And then, uh, so this is a case of uh, one particular C. And uh, when uh, C is distributed by Gaussian, then uh, you have to take the expectation value of this quantity. Uh, this is nothing but the uh, integration of a C with this Gaussian factor. So what uh, the purpose of this uh, talk is just compute uh, this integration. Then you obtain the uh, distribution of the uh, eigenvector. And so uh, to do that, I uh, rewrite this integration in terms of P-theory. And uh, the first uh, I mean challenge is to uh, rewrite this determinant factor and then uh, rewrite this delta function part. So now uh, let me first uh, rewrite this determinant factor. The, the challenge here is that uh, you have uh, absolute value. Uh, it's not analytical function, so therefore you have to do something uh, for, uh, to overcome this uh, I mean, non-analyticity. So the, of course uh, the, the uh, most, uh, uh, the simplest uh, um, a uh, solution is just forget this uh, absolute value. But still the problem is interesting. And in this case, uh, this is just uh, this, um, uh, that now this is just the determinant. So therefore, uh, by introducing uh, a couple of uh, fermions, you can uh, rewrite this determinant factor with this form. But of course, uh, what we are, we are interested in the distribution itself. So therefore, we have to do a little bit more. Uh, in the, uh, so uh, one can uh, try this uh, expression here. Uh, here, uh, in the, uh, we, I have introduced two parameters, epsilon and r. Uh, when r goes to one half and epsilon goes to zero, then this is expected to become determinant of this absolute value. And, uh, um, for, integer, the, and uh, for integer r, you, one can uh, rewrite this, uh, this one. Uh, by using um, a number of fermions again. Uh, so, um, so in this process of taking one half, uh, you have to take a, a do an analytic continuation, but otherwise you can compute uh, this quantity by, uh, by this fermionic integration. Uh, but uh, there is more um, direct uh, way, and uh, uh, you can just uh, um, uh, rewrite this determinant factor by using fermions and bosons uh, like that. Now, the, uh, the, uh, another factor uh, in this uh, integration is the data function part. But uh, this is uh, very trivial because uh, we know that uh, this is just uh, given by this uh, uh, integration, integration expression. So therefore, uh, uh, what we generally have to do is uh, this uh, integration. Here, uh, C is the, uh, this uh, first term is just uh, 
are expressing the, that the um, C is uh, distributed by Gaussian, and this is the data coming from. This comes from the delta function, and this is the uh, uh, this is a free theoretical. This free theoretical part is to deal with determinant factor. Anyway, uh, this action uh, has uh, uh, this uh, quadratic and linear form or in, in terms of C and lambda. So therefore, C and lambda can be integrated out easily. As, and uh, so um, finally, uh, you obtain an effective field theory of bosons and fermions with quartic interactions. Oh, two mean? <laughs> really? Uh, so OK. Um, so now uh, what we have to do is to compute the effective field theories. Uh, for the uh, case of uh, forgetting the uh, absolute value, uh, what you obtain is uh, this uh, four Fermi uh, interactions, uh, interacting theory, and uh, you can uh, exactly compute uh, the expression, and uh, you obtain confer confident hypergeometric function of the second kind, and uh, uh, you can uh, compare the result with uh, Monte Carlo simulation, and uh, good, uh, good uh, agreement is obtained. And uh, uh, for the case of, uh, I mean, real uh, distribution, uh, the action it becomes quite complicated. Uh, but still, uh, one can uh, do that uh, exact analytic expression for small nr in terms of error functions. And this is an uh, I mean, uh, example. Yeah. And also, in the large n limit, uh, you can use the uh, technique of sugar dash equation. And uh, it turns out that the eigenvalue distribution for large n limit is given by a Gaussian in this form. And uh, uh, the result are, uh, is uh, compared with Monte Carlo simulations, and uh, we obtain good agreement. So uh, this is a summary. And, and uh, so uh, we have computed real eigenvalue vector distributions for all the three real symmetric tensors with Gaussian distributions. We, I have obtained some exact analytical expressions, and the large end limit is shown to be uh, Gaussian, which contra contrasts with Wigner's semicircle law in the matrix model. Uh, there are uh, uh, similar procedure can be, uh, I mean, applied to for a little bit more uh, general cases. And uh, for example, correlations among eigenvectors mm, would be very interesting because we know that in the matrix models, eigenvalues are reversive. And uh, how about tensor model is a natural question. Uh, and also, uh, uh, we obtain exact analytic expression, at least for small n and r. But uh, probably, this is all true for any n and, any n and r. We, I want to understand this integrability. And there are some extensions of uh, introducing uh, allowance and backgrounds and complex cases and tensor lock -like decomposition. OK, thank you. Great. Thank you very much uh, for the uh, talk that you fit exactly in this 12 minutes. Uh, and now we have a few minutes time for questions from the audience. Yes. Just a question about, uh, mm -hmm. so once you know this uh, eigenvalue for these tensors, how much uh, do you know about the tensor? Can you, in the matrix, you can reconstruct the, the matrix from the oh, knowledge of the eigenvalue. So what's the correspondence oh. there? I see. Uh, that's a, a very good question. And uh, so it's, um, mm, eigenvector, uh, uh, I think eigenvector represents uh, some, uh, I mean, uh, properties of the ISM, uh, the tensor itself, but uh, I think that the um, more direct relation can be obtained by tensor rank decomposition. It's a uh, uh, kind of uh, expressing the tensor in terms of uh, a number of uh, uh, vectors. And uh, this is correspond to the, uh, what do you say, uh, the uh, singular value decomposition of the matrix. Uh, yeah. uh, and uh, so therefore, uh, this uh, represent more the uh, this, uh, I mean, the property of the tensor, but rather, um, I, 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 um, yeah, I, um, currently I'm not so sure whether this, uh, uh, I mean, the eigenvector, uh, how much eigenvector uh, explain, uh, I mean, uh, describe the tensor itself. Yeah. Thank you. Is there any more, are there any more questions? Then maybe I will have one more. Okay. Uh, I'm a numerical guy. I like to make simulations. And uh, my question is, do you know if there are uh, numerical methods to compute eigenvalues of some tensor? Uh, 
if there are any methods or are they efficient or what is the complexity? Or you, you don't care about numerical uh, You mean that the, the how uh, I did the Monte Carlo simulation for this? Uh, no, no, is there, is there a way to compute that? Yeah. To diagonalize? Yeah, diagonalize. Ah, exactly, diagonalization. Or maybe some oh. Uh, again, I think uh, diagonalization of the tensor correspond to this uh, tensor rank decomposition mm -hmm. uh, rather than the uh, eigenvalue equation, eigenvector okay. equation. Yeah. Thank you very much. And let's uh, switch to the next talk. Okay. Uh, yes, so the next speaker is Sergei Bondarenko uh, from Ariel University. And uh, he will give a talk titled CPTM uh, Symmetry and Cosmological Constant in Formalism of Extended Manifold. Yes, please. So thank you for the invitation. <coughs> the talk is formally is very uh, unusual, not, not orthodoxal. Orthodoxic and uh, I will begin from some things about the shadow universe. The idea was almost 60 years old. Yes, people tried to restore some symmetry, and restoration was made by a simple trick. They simply added some matter called by shadow or mirror universe to our sector and assumed that the interaction between two sectors is very weak, weak in the sense that there is gravitational one, and the whole matter now will restore the symmetry. This idea can understand what I want to do in relation to the smallness of the cosmological constant. So two things must be understood from this, uh, let's say, construction. First of all, how to increase the degrees of freedom of the theory, and second, how to introduce the interaction between two sectors. So the first point is the doubling of the degrees of freedom. Uh, it can be done by so-called CPTM transform. Let's take two manifolds, A and B, and let's make the mat of B manifolds, uh, let's say, similar to the mat of A manifolds by CPTM transform, but let's say uh, changing the gravitational mass of the particles. Namely, instead of gravitational plus, we will get gravitational minus. Inertial mass, of course, will be the same and uh, apply all this transform to everything we have. Of course, this is an old idea. In some sense, uh, this idea is very well known. If you consider, for example, Schwarz's solution, it simply transform one and third regions of the Schwarz's solution in terms of the extended coordinates. So in some sense, it's uh, not something too exotic. So now we have doubled, doubled degrees of freedom. Uh, interaction between them, I'll talk a little bit later, but how, how it works really. For scalar fields, simplest example, nothing is crucial change in the Lagrangian because Lagrangian is square root of mass and uh, gravitational field is tensor one, not changing under CPTM, but what is changing is the apparatus of creation and annihilation. If you, let's say, redefine all these apparatus in correspondingly to the CPTM, what you'll get, first of all, that average vector of momentum energy will be zero precisely without normal ordering. There is no normal ordering required because you have two fields ordering by the way that this is precisely zero. And the second thing that the propagator of the B-manifold meta is, well, let's say, minus Dyson propagator is also a known thing. This is hint how it must work, the interaction between two, because this is precisely what happened in the schwinger keldish or keldish schwinger approach in the non <laughs> equilibrium condensed metaphysics. So, about uh, fermions, how it works. For fermions, something is more difficult because mass is change the sign, but Virbian has also changed the sign. So, after all, we have the uh, Lagrangian with the sum of difference between of two terms, A and B manifold. Directly is not interacting, no interaction. There's no direct interaction between two terms. It's not B metric model. We have A, B, not interacting things. Uh, Connection is not changing, okay? So this is our action, this is our connection. And the next step we can do is simply calculate the effective action. 
by calculated effective action because we want to watch what happened with bad contribution to the cosmological constant. Uh, cosmological constant. Bad contribution means uh, very simple thing. Namely, we calculate uh, no, where is it? We calculate one loop contribution to effective action. Yes. In terms of effective action, is stat po and two legs contributions, and uh, we see what will happen with that. We will calculate. So the contribution, because of their actions precisely the same, the one loop contribution precisely the same as well. But when you regularize the actions, they will get different signs. Propagators are different. Po of propagators are different. And when making, let's say, rotation to Euclidean space for one loop diagrams, of course, what you will get that one one part of the action will get plus, another minus, because one part have Feynman propagator, another have Dyson propagator, and that have different signs in overall answer. So this contribution is precisely zero. And the same about the second one, contribution to effective action with two external legs is also precisely zero. So no bad contribution to the cosmological constant. They simply canceled one with another. Two things about that, of course, must be said. If we talk about the Keodes Schwinger approach, it's not all the contribution we have. And of course, contribution are cancelled when we have the same gravitational legs, let's say, attached to the diagrams. Otherwise, it will not be cancelled. So I will talk about this a little bit later. Now, one loop in gravity action together. So we have now spin or one loop action, what remain from this uh, action after the cancellations. And we add in the same manner that we add the gravitational action, two parts for A and B manifolds. Okay. Standard definition, nothing special in this case, and a uh, few words also only about the interaction. We now have two manifolds. We double the degrees of freedom, and the question how we arrange the interaction between them. In fact, answer is known because in Schwinger Keldish approach, it's precisely the same. If you know, you don't, uh, but if you know for sure that the Schwinger Keldish approach, we have twice more green functions. We have so called diagonal and non diagonal green functions. So in this case, the all interaction between A and B manifolds is through non-diagonal green functions. It's very weak, it's very almost zero, let's say it will be zero for many, many contributions, but there is no direct interaction, only interaction through non-diagonal green functions which arise automatically in this approach and in Dyson Schinger approach. So now we can as example make usual quantization, so it's usual field theory. You write very, very long effective action. It's long because we, first of all, twice write the action terms for each field, and after that, we add non diagonal terms. It's long, it's simple, but it's long, simply long. Uh, what is interesting about all this construction, if you calculate now this, this is non diagonal green function, you see this is RAF4, not 2, this is Feynman, this is Dyson, and this is non diagonal. What is interesting that inevitably you get immediately that usual graviton propagator is modified. Because you have non-diagonal contribution, you have new terms, and now it behaves differently from the usual one. In some sense, of course, it's mimic of the dark matter. So it's kind of bonus. I don't know what precisely it will give, but it's different from the usual one. It's not the same as if you consider simply the, let's say, ordinary quantum field theory. Okay? Now, uh, different scenario, how I introduce the gravitational field. First of all, I remind we have VRBN fields and gravitational fields. So I have to define how they connect Virbin with gravitational field. The first possibility is the simplest one, usual schwinger keldish Each Virbin is each gravitational field, yes. I calculate here the cosmological constant, so it wasn't initially in the action, simply calculate like a linear term with respect to the perturbation, to the H. I get two answers. This answer is simply, as usual, is a trace of the momentum and energy tensor. Zero mu mu, so I have two different answers. Of course, on the level of action, there is not will be full cancellation. Okay, classical value. I remind that one loop values are zero precisely. <coughs> on the classical level, it not will be cancellation. Why? Because we are being fields now are different. Free fields may be the same, but for the second order, free fields will be different. Therefore, therefore, for usual prescription, we are being gravitational field, no cancellation will happen for classical values. No full cancellation will happen also for the one loop, no zero. But this is kind of strange prescription because the uh, whole model is very similar to electrodynamics. You have plus minus charges, you have one photon field interact with this 
two charges, why we have to define two different gravitational fields. So let's do like that. Make the same VR being, one VR being, sum of two, H, H, okay? And now matter field interact equally with each, each gravity field, H and AB. Somehow it's one defined photon. Again, this is long. It's long because simply I have uh, non-diagonal terms, each term is twice, so it's simple but long. I can now calculate the cosmological constant. Now I see it's an interesting thing. My cosmological constant is the same for both manifolds, and this is difference on T mu, T mu, T mu, T mu. So it's a mind, again, this is classical value. For this case, because I defined Verbein the same, yes, for each manifold, one loop contribution are precisely zero, and classical value is difference of two contributions. Again, we have here two cases, trivial one, simply equal. It means that we have manifold A and manifold B with the same time axis, the same direction, so first order value is simply zero with the echo, but we have two manifolds with different direction of time. We can simply exp expand each t in respect to some local time, t large is uh, time of life of universe, universe, and we get that our cosmological constant proportion to this value, one divided by four t, Planck mass, and change, change of the ng momentum tensor with time. Uh, again, you know, not know, this is <coughs> in some extent very similar to what was happened for uh, Hoyle Narlikar model of cosmo cosmology invited it before, before Big Bang model. So you, in this case, get very simple answer that cosmological constant is proportional to the change of the matter density of the universe because of interaction between two manifolds. And it divided one divided by T. And last variant is exotic one, simply one gravitational field. Okay, nothing is... Uh, let's say separate, only basic maybe geometry is different, but uh, weak field is the same. Again, what is interesting here, that here for gravi gravity we get some combination of two propagators, uh, Dyson is Feynman maybe. In this case, it's possible that here we arise kind of Wheeler-Feynman propagator. And uh, again, no, you don't know, for this case of propagator, there is no asymptotic states. It's also a very interesting possibility can be in general. So my conclusion is very long, but simply can say that uh, what was assumed is a very simple thing. To my opinion, it's a very physical thing, that there is the existence of negative mass particles. <laughs> this, uh, which particles are separated from our, let's say, universe, from our world, they occupy something different. The interaction between, between two manifolds are very weak, and they, let's say, built with the help of the schwinger mechanism, non-diagonal green function. In this case, what you get for different scenario, first of all, cancellation of bad contribution to the cosmological constant, one loop contribution, okay? And on a classical level, cosmological constant is also can be small, very small. And as a bonus, you get that your propagator is also, let's say, transformed, is not really usual to propagator, it's very similar to the Mont model. It's kind of mimic gain dark matter behavior. I don't know is it, is it or it doesn't, but it's mimic that. And uh, again, last thing, maybe very interesting also, <laughs> we have cancellation of, what, I guess, whole, all one loop contribution to the effective action. In this sense, it's very interesting to understand how the renormalizability will work in this case. I done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we still have a few minutes for questions, so are there any questions? Then maybe I'll ask a question. Could you maybe uh, repeat what is the motivation for these two manifolds A and B? Is there an interpret physical interpretation? Physically or? means that uh, it's a very physical question why we have no particles with a negative mass. Mm -hmm. In some sense, if you have charges and there is no physical law which forbid that you have gravity with, let's say, behaves precisely like us, it's the same work precisely. If you inside this manifold, you will not understand this is negative mass. But only, like a charge, so really, mm -hmm. you only have to, let's say, understand it that positive and negative masses submit. But because they are in different manifold, you simply don't see them more oh. or a lot. But motivation is very simple in some sense, because if you look on the Schwarzschild solution, this is precisely what you get if you make CPTM to, from one to three. You simply see that this is mm -hmm. really glued to, to patches of the whole solution. In some sense, you can check, take, take, let's say, classical solution, 
of gravity, makes EPTM, and you'll see that it simply transforms to itself in terms of functions, but not in terms of global coordinates. You have to see also on global coordinates if you have for some manifold, and you'll see the time will be inversed and everything will be inversed. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, are there maybe some questions? Yes. Just a naive question. So there is this model by um, Latham Boyle, Neil Turok, and collaborators for yeah. the CPT symmetric universe, where they do something that looks a little bit similar, and they basically have a, a CPT copy. Yeah, they have of CPT. Our yeah, they have yes. CPT and say about what's happened, what's happened uh, after the Big Bang. Let's say that's right. Yeah. But they also talk about dark matter, and they make a prediction for like right-handed neutrinos and things like this. Have, is there any connection to what you're doing? Uh, first of all, because they have CPT as a connection, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. uh, second of all, it was about the cosmological constant, it wasn't about the dark matter. Simply, when you calculate the propagate, you suddenly see that it's changed. Mm -hmm. The change of propagate is kind of Mond effect, yes, and uh, it's uh, simply it's very funny because you give dark matter not by exotic particles and usual gravity, but usual particle and exotic gravity, something versa, but it's here. Of course, in this sense, it's very restrictable but because you can calculate uh, simultaneously two things, cosmological constant and uh, propagate, and simply see which scenario can be true, can, which can be not. It's kind of uh, many possibilities, in fact, okay, you have. Thank but you. of course, it's similar, it's similar in any sense. Uh, thank you very much. It's time to move on to the next speaker. Okay, and the third speaker is Markus Frug uh, from uh, Leipzig University, uh, and he will talk about invariant observables in quantum gravity and gravitational loop corrections to the Newtonian potential. Please start. Thank you very much. You can hear me. Wonderful. Uh, I only have a short amount of time, so let's not waste time with any introductions. Um, I'm doing perturbative quantum gravity. Uh, I'm not an algebraic quantum field theorist yet, but Kasha is trying to convince me to become Oh, fully to the mathematician side, anyway. Come to the third side. Yes. Do you have cookies? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you all know what we do. We take our metric, put a background, some perturbations, quantized perturbations. Uh, the perturbation parameter is uh, kappa, square root of the nuisance constant, with c equal h bar equal 1. So it's very small, Planck length, uh, essentially. So it's a very good perturbation theory. Uh, we also have symmetries, also gauge, symmet uh, gauge theory. Uh, symmetries are infinitesimal diffeomorphisms. They work like that. Uh, particular gauge transformation of the metric perturbation is the well-known symmetrized uh, derivative of the uh, gauge parameter plus higher order corrections. And uh, then it's known, well, I put here a reference of Burgess, but there's an older review by Donahue, that the usual methods of quantum field theory and curved space-time uh, can be applied to that, and you can make predictions. Uh, and those predictions, they are valid at length scales larger than the fundamental scale, which in this case is the Planck length, or if you want that energy scales below that scale. Yeah, so this is it's a very, uh, say, maybe naive approach, but uh, it's like Newtonian gravity and Einstein gravity. The predictions here are valid at uh, appropriate scales, and any fundamental theory in the appropriate limit must give the same predictions. So I think it's worthwhile studying. Uh, okay, yeah, it's extremely efficient. I said that. It's a very good perturbation theory. In fact, it's so good that only the tree level predictions can be experimentally verified. Right? The CMB, that's the CMB spectrum. Uh, and as we've heard, well, uh, many talks, the main issue, or one of the main issues, is the construction of observables. Because uh, the gauge symmetry is uh, very different from the usual ones. And we all know young Mill series, uh, so that's an internal gauge symmetry. That means it acts on the field variables at any given point. So, for example, uh, then you can take things like the trace of f squared, so f a mu nu, f a mu nu. That's the gauge invariant quantity at one single point. And then when compute these things, there's a mathematical theory behind that, cohomology theory, it's very nice. Uh, but in quantum gravity, perturbative, you can also remove the quantum, uh, gauge symmetry is something very different. They are diffeomorphisms, or infinitesimal diffeomorphisms, if it's perturbative, and those move points. So any field at a fixed point can, by, by definition, essentially not be gauge invariant, and uh, that means that there are no local observables, yeah, with, of course, always exceptions to the rule, but this is sort of the uh, main message, and the question is, okay, so the exception are linear order things, uh, at higher orders, one can think of stuff. We've heard of many things, uh, observables. Uh, so you can average quantities. You can look at things at fixed geodesic distance and average those. 
You can look at the S matrix. That's, of course, a very well-known non-local observable. It connects the past, infinite past with the infinite future. Uh, but of course, on the other hand, we can make local measurements. Yeah? If I would drop this now, it would fall down. That would be a measurement. Uh, so the question is, how can you reconcile this with the non-locality of observables? And uh, the answer is, well, we've heard this already, but let me emphasize the point again. Uh, what we actually do is we make relational measurements. Yeah, we always look at the state of one field with respect to another field. So, for example, uh, that point with respect to the floor. And, uh, yeah, gravity with respect to matter, for example. Yeah. Now the question is just, uh, can we make this uh, nice and precise? And uh, yes, we can do. We've heard the talk, uh, of course, on this. Uh, Relational observables. Kasha told us this morning in a very mathematical way how to construct these. So maybe for physicists such as me, I need a more pedestrian way. That's a pedestrian way. We take n scalar fields. So if we're in n dimensions, if we're in four dimensions, we take four. Uh, they can depend on the field content, so on the metric, meta fields, whatever you have. And they should transform as scalars under diffeomorphisms. Yeah, I'm perturbative, so I also take a background. I expand my function, whatever I have in perturbation theory. I invert that, so then I get x0 as a function of x. And if x transforms as a scalar, that transforms inversely to a scalar. So now I can just compose. I evaluate my field A that I want to measure at the position x0 and hold the capital X fixed. And this is something relational. Yeah? Uh, the x mu that are defined in that way, uh, they are field-dependent coordinates. And A of chi, that's the value of A at that point where the chi is equal to capital X. And then evaluating at x0, it's a field on the background. Uh, these relational observables, of course, uh, they can be used in all formalisms, also more fundamental things. Uh, okay, so these ones I'm, say, uh, not totally unfamiliar with, so that's why I put them, but I refer to you to the nice talk by Philip on Tuesday, who has a more complete picture and also more names. Sorry if, if I forgot anyone. I certainly forgot many people. Okay, uh, so what can you do? Well, as Kasha said, one can choose some curvature scalars, some scalar fields. But there's a problem, because if you have a highly symmetric background, like Minkowski or the sitter space, you don't discriminate the points. If you add some scalars, you change your theory. And then, uh, well, some people have said that the algebraic approach is, uh, doesn't add anything new. I think Rudy is somewhere in the audience. Uh, but that's not true. So if you look at that very nice paper, many people paper, they had an idea on how to actually do these things to all orders in perturbation theory. And I think, well, in my opinion, that was really a breakthrough. Uh, the original proposal has some issues, but those can be fixed. Uh, you can look at the papers. Uh, and what happens is that the observables that you get in this way, they're very nice. They are non-local, because they must be. But the non-locality is restricted to the past light cone. Yeah, so they involve in a nice uh, microcosal fashion, you could say. Uh, they fulfill all the nice things that you want in a perturbative theory. Non-perturbatively, I have no idea. OK, and then one can use them to do computations. So this is the second part of my talk. I'm still fine on time, I think. Very good. Uh, so one can use the relational framework to define an invariant metric perturbation. So it's the first order is just the usual one, plus and then the symmetrized the derivative of the first order coordinate corrections. And then one can really check, I mean, uh, compute the variation of that from the metric perturbation. You get the symmetrized the derivative of the gauge parameter, and the axis should transform as a scalar. So to lowest order, it gives another xi, and it just cancels. Yeah. By construction, of course, it works to all orders. Uh, and then, well, invariant Newtonian gravitational potential, I just define it as in classical GR, minus one half the time time component of that thing. Expectation value because I'm in quantum theory. And now I can compute things. I said we need gravity plus matter. So for the matter, we take a point particle, yeah, just something that is here. And we compute the H00 in the theory, which has uh, action of that plus gravity action. OK, there's some einbein, whatever. Uh, this has some additional symmetry, so one needs to be a bit careful with that. BST formalism is helpful. Uh, and what we want is we want the corrections due to graviton loops. But of course, this is a quantum particle, yeah? It's when it, it fluctuates. So what uh, we have to do is we take a large mass expansion. If something's heavy, it should not fluctuate. Yeah, that's the idea. Uh, not completely successful, but, uh, well, one can try. So position of the particle, it's just, uh, well, it sits at one point yeah, at the center, just evolves in time, and then there's some fluctuations. And OK, the iron band also fluctuates. <coughs> Whatever. Uh, one can use QFT. There are many, many diagrams. There are graviton and ghost loops. There are world line corrections. So those involve uh, these fluctuations y here. They're classical corrections, and they're corrections from the x mu. Now, the nice thing is we have something gauge invariant. Uh, so we can use any gauge. And the nice gauge is one that uh, kills you half of the diagrams, because then it's half of the work. Uh, we compute the classical correction that agrees with the expansion of the Schwarzschild metric in harmonic coordinates. So that's a very good check on the result. Yeah, that's what we should get. 
And then we get a quantum corrected potential. Uh, so what we have, classical potential. Yeah, uh, This is the classical correction at second order. And then there are two different quantum contributions. Uh, first one is this. So by dimensional reasons, they always must come with a factor of h bar g over r squared. There's no other possibility in flat space. So the only non-trivial thing is the coefficient. And this first one here, this 41 over 10 pi, that agrees with the results uh, derived using the inverse scattering method, where you look at scattering of two scalar particles in flat space, compute the S-matrix element, and then check which potential gives you the same element, same S-matrix element. So this is this universal factor. Uh, so just for reference, uh, this factor, well, there are various groups, various people took 10 years to get right. Uh, this was a master's student, so <laughs> just for comparison. And then we have a second term, and this second term is, uh, well, I tried, we wanted to suppress particle fluctuations, but we didn't manage. Yeah? So there's no way to suppress completely the fluctuations of that particle itself. And the second term comes exactly from the fluctuations of the world line of the heavy particle that we look at. Okay. So it's remnant of uh, Zitter bewegung at in uh, Dirac theory. Uh, and you can find, well, many more, and that's the reference. So that's the good master student. Uh, okay, uh, this is what it looks like, basically exaggerated, of course. So uh, it dips down a bit more below. So you can say, okay, what does it mean? It means that the gravitational force is strengthened by quantum corrections at small distances. Uh, the potential is lower. Or if you see this as, a, say, corrections to a black hole, then you can say, well, the horizon is where the potential uh, passes zero, so the horizon radius decreases a bit. Uh, but okay, it is microscopic. No, no way to actually measure that in any sensible way. Um, and then I still have some time, wonderful. So I can also come to meta loop corrections. Uh, so this was all, sorry, this was all flat space. Yeah, so there's basically nothing that you can get except some coefficient Planck length squared over R squared. But if you go to a better background like the sitter, that's what I did as well, the sitter space, you can get other corrections. And those corrections are actually exciting. Um, gravitons in the sitter are very hard. Uh, Richard Wooders has already departed, so I can't give him the task of computing them. Uh, but uh, can go meta loop corrections, and the meta loop corrections they are a bit easier. Uh, this is yeah, it's actually did something previously, and we took conformal meta just for simplicity, because then computations are nice and easy. Uh, and you see, so again, there's some term that goes like Planck length squared over R squared. Uh, so it's actually a physical distance. That's the one that you want. But then there's another term here, and what I want to draw attention to is this very last term. That's the log R. So this is something that, unlike those terms does not decrease at large distances, it grows. Yeah, it's an effect that if you're sufficiently far away from the particle, actually could be measurable. Not in practice, unfortunately, but in principle. And uh, one can also generalize this to spinning particles, then you get corrections to gravitomagnetic potential, the zero I part, and again, there are some logarithmically growing terms. So now, the good thing would be if one would have uh, I don't know, an infinite number of master students, put each one of them at one loop order higher, and generalize this to all loop orders, and then think about, so what are the leading corrections? Uh, could it be that one could resum them to get some different fall-off behavior of R, like not one over R, but one over R to the one half, yeah, and then maybe explain Mond from first principles, yeah, if you're into that. Okay, so that's it, I think. I'm fine on time, wonderful. Uh, we have the issue of gauge and observables, so I think that's a central theme to all approaches in quantum gravity. So it, and it can connect the perturbative thing with fundamental approaches, whatever you like. Observables, they are non-local, I mean necessarily, uh, but one can compute relation observables and in fact to all orders. And the results, uh, one can use them to compute things, so we get very nice results. We get the strengthening of the gravitational force, yeah, that was the picture I showed. Uh, we get logarithmically growing corrections to the Newtonian and gravitomagnetic potential in the sitter space, you know, something that maybe could have observable consequences. Uh, there's other work, so I can look, for example, at corrections to the Hubble rate that measures the expansion of the universe. You get some secular screening, so it goes down. And whatever else you like, the theory is there, so you can now start computing. I invite you to do that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right on time. And now, questions. Do you know under what circumstances your relational coordinates are globally defined and actually give you a good coordinate system? I mean, for example, do, do, don't you ever get caustics or 
uh, are, right. can you continue the evolution indefinitely into the mm -hmm. future, issues like that? Uh, that's a good question. So um, the issues don't arise here because I'm really strictly perturbative. So I'm always assuming that any corrections are vastly smaller than whatever background structure I have. Um, of course, it depends on what exactly are the coordinates that you choose. So I think there are some uh, which are better suited to avoid such problems of caustics and so on. But this is really strictly perturbative. Just a, a clarification uh, mm -hmm. question. You mentioned this 43 over 10 that reproduces the, the, the usual results of 41. Mm -hmm. But then you said there's another contribution. Mm -hmm. that So this one is, can you explain? It, it, it was not expected or it comes from the... Uh, the coordinate fluctuating? I missed exactly what... Yes, yes. Was the uh, so this okay. one comes... So this one is the gravitational vacuum polarization. So this comes from loops of gravitons and ghosts and whatever. And these ones are fluctuations of that body that I'm looking at. So... Uh, it's a different situation. So the previous calculations, uh, Donahue, uh, Hriplovich, Kirillin, what they do is they scatter scalar fields. So it's a completely different thing. Uh, and in fact, uh, I would not have been surprised if the result would have been completely different. But it's a different physical situation. So you really get one body and then polarization and they looked at scattering things. But it turns out that actually the result is universal. Yeah, one of them. Okay, let's move to the last question. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to point out that the gravitationally based relational observables you've been discussing are equivalent to the uh, gravitational dressing construction, first of all. And secondly, uh, though, when you solve the conditions to get the, uh, say, dressed observables, in the harmonic case, uh, basically, I, I think you're dropping a boundary term. And because of that, they don't satisfy the diff invariance conditions under harmonic diffeomorphisms. When you add that boundary term back in, then they aren't as local as I think you've said. Right, so uh, I mean, we had to talk by Philip Hearn on Tuesday who was connecting all these different approaches. And I mean, he was also pointing out that uh, this is, well, okay. uh, that one can reformulate this in a, in a language of dressed observables, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing I would not agree. So these things transform as they do under localized diffeomorphisms. I'm not saying anything about the structure at infinity. Uh, there are no localized harmonic diffeomorphisms, so then the question doesn't arise. Okay, well let's postpone further discussions to the coffee break and uh, I would like to invite the next speaker. Thank you very much. So the next speaker is, if I get it right, uh, Antoine renon uh who will talk about second law from the nether current on null hypersurfaces. Uh, Yes, please, the floor is yours. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the organizer for this very nice conference and for giving me the opportunity to talk here. So today I will talk about the second law from the Nether current on the hypersurfaces. And uh, the question I want to address today is based on the seminal work of uh, Wold and Ayer and Wold, who showed that in the case of uh, uh, stationary uh, black hole, the uh, Nutter charge, the entropy was given by the Nutter charge associated to the null killing horizon. They were, in fact, able to relate the ADM charges at infinity with the charges, uh, the charge on the on the horizon uh, in the presence of a background killing field. And, but what about the dynamical case? Because we know that satisfying the first law is not sufficient to have a well-defined notion of entropy. We also need uh, some balance law, and which shows that uh, for a closed system, at least the entropy increases and is positive. And we know that we are, I wanted to ask if this is possible to uh, find this construction for uh, notar charge associated to some null diffeomorphism in general. Also, you know that you can compute the notar charge on very uh, general null hypersurface, and uh, those uh, these uh, notar charges uh, satisfy a similar properties as the entropy. So first, before coming to the art of the matter, uh, we have to review the construction of the Nutter charge and uh, the, the balance law. So first, uh, we have uh, some theory described by some Lagrangian L. We know that when we take the variation of this Lagrangian, we have a sum of two terms, the equation of motions plus 
uh, boundary term that is a symplectic potential. And from this symplectic potential in the Lagrangian, we can deduce some network current jigsaw. And that is conserved if two uh, conditions are satisfied. The first one is the on-shell condition, so the equation of motion should be satisfied. And the second one is that if there are some uh, background uh, uh, field uh, chi, uh, the uh, uh, deformorphism uh, chi should be a symmetry of this background. So we can just think, for instance, a uh, very simple example of the background being the matrix, and then uh, the deformorphism should be a killing field that uh, acts on, uh, on, on this metric. So uh, from this, uh, from the previous formula, we can actually uh, integrate it on a finite region of space-time M, uh, comprised of two space-like hypersurfaces and uh, uh, null or time-like boundary, and then we get uh, the uh, variation of the notar charge on these space-like superfaces, uh, given by a sum of two terms. The first one is a symplectic FERX through the boundary N, and the second one is a term that appears actually when the equation of motion are not satisfied, and it really means that we missed some degrees of freedom. If they are not satisfied, it means that we have missed some degrees of freedom in the description of our, of our system, because here we, I'm classical, so I assume they should hold, and uh, this is that uh, why I call this last term a non-equilibrium term. And uh, to understand how it works, actually, we can apply it to uh, uh, of very standard situations. The first one is uh, classical electromagnetism in uh, uh, general space-time with the killing vector psi. So we see that uh, in that case, uh, if there is some time-like killing vector, the notar charge will be the electromagnetic energy. And we know that the variation of electromagnetic energy between two space-like uh, slices is given by the uh, flux of the uh, pointing vector uh, on uh, the surface N, on the boundary N, plus a term that appears if the vacuum Maxwell equations are not satisfied because we have missed uh, the degrees of freedom of the charge matter that get interact and exchange energy with the electromagnetic field. For gravity, this is similar if we have a deferromorphism invariant theory, except that here we know that the neutral charge is on shell actually a surface uh, charge, and then we have exactly the same uh, result. So the variation of the neutral charge is given by a symplectic flux plus uh, uh, the stress energy tensor that uh, is uh, this uh, that appears ex as if the Einstein equations are not satisfied in vacuum because we have some some matter then and if the null upper surface is null and if the null energy conditions are satisfied actually uh, this term is positive and this is very analogous you know to the usual balance law uh, for entropy where you know that the vari entropy variation is given by a uh, uh, flux term uh, heat flux term plus an entropy creation term that is positive so uh, here, of course, this creation, entropy creation term is analogous to uh, uh, this uh, T mu nu, psi mu and u for uh, psi being uh, yeah, the uh, uh, null, uh, uh, future pointing null uh, vector on the null upper surface. So from this, what we can do now is we want to compute some uh, neutral charges for our, uh, for our gravity. So we start from general relativity and uh, we uh, have to take some symplectic potential in order to compute the charge. How do we choose it? So first, we have to restrict ourselves to some phase space in order to kill some gauge redundancy. And uh, by doing this, uh, we, uh, uh, we, have, uh, we uh, have also to restrict ourselves to the deformorphisms which preserve these uh, gauge restrictions. And the vice super translations that I wrote here were uh, uh, the uh, general uh, value supertransformation is given by a factor W times V dV, or dV is the uh, null vector that, uh, and V is the affine coordinate, uh, uh, is one of these uh, symmetry diffeomorphisms that preserves these uh, uh, phase space restrictions. And then the symplectic potential that we ha get here is actually in the form P delta Q is Q variant, with Q being the configuration variable uh, here, which is the metric. And I call it D like Dirichlet because you know this is just, uh, it vanishes when we impose the Dirichlet boundary conditions on the null hypersurface. So from it, we can compute the charge. And from the charge, we can use the formulas on the previous slide to compute the charge variation, the balance law equations. And an interesting case is when we apply actually this uh, balance law to a perturbed uh, kilogram horizons, uh, the uh, symplectic flux turns out to be of second order. If psi now is the uh, perturbed killing field, I mean in the uh, background killing field, sorry, 
that is actually a vice super translation. And uh, we see that uh, because uh, this uh, axi theta is of second order, the charge variation is entirely given by uh, the flux of matter crossing the, the horizons, which is a linear combination of the killing energy, the killing angular momentum, and the electric charge. And that, by identification, should be proportional to the entropy variations. But the surprise here is that the little surprise that the entropy is given, there is this additional term in uh, the definition of the entropy, which is proportional to the uh, derivative of the area. And actually, it may, it may surprise you, fun because we know that the first law works uh, when uh, the uh, entropy is the einstein hawking uh, uh, becker stein uh, uh entropy. But uh, we should keep in mind that this formula of the first law actually works between in phase space between two equilibrium solutions in phase space. While here, we are not really at equilibrium because we perturbed the black hole with some incoming matter. So uh, it means that this first law actually is more, is closer uh, to uh, the physical process first law than the equilibrium process first law. And you know that when you derive, you derive the PPFL, the physical process first law, you have to integrate at some point between infinity and the bifurcation surface. And in only if you do that, you get that the entropy, the, the entropy variation is given by the area variation. But if you don't, you get this local uh, definition and dynamical definition of entropy, and you have this local and uh, version of the, the first law. Uh, so this is good, but uh, we still have issues with this uh, directly dynamic potential because, as we said, uh, because, okay, first of all, the first law actually, uh, as I said, works only uh, between equilibrium state in usual. Uh, thermodynamics, but uh, also we want that uh, an entropy that increase in time, and uh, this one, this Dirichlet entropy actually increases in time and is positive at first and second order in perturbation around the background killing field, but not uh, at the early stage of the collapse. So how do we do, do we change our definitions of the neutral charge to get something that might be better? There is no many choices, actually. We, if we start from the Dirichlet symplectic potential, the only sure, uh, thing that we can do to have another covariant symplectic potential, you make an integration by part in field space. And we have no, uh, new charges associated to the vibe super translations, which are very similar to the Dirichlet one, except that there is now a one divided by d minus two in front of this expansion. And from this, we can calculate the charge variation associated to this uh, Dirichlet super translations uh, with a diffeomorphism that here is no more. Is this is a vibe super translation normalized to W equals one for simplicity. And you find these equations, uh, six, seven, that, uh, I mean, this is one equation, that actually, which is interesting it, here, is that the last term is positive, is the energy condition are satisfied. Uh, the second term, the sh uh, shear squared term, is uh, always positive. And the first term is positive if the expansion is positive and uh, smaller than d minus two. And actually, we can prove theorems from this. We can prove that if n is the general null hypersurface, that it has topology b times r. It means where b is some compact space. It means that the null geodesics cross the compact space only once. And uh, if uh, it is future complete, complete, which is mean that we can x take uh, the affine parameter v to infinity, uh, then um, then, uh, for, uh, uh, if we take uh, some vibe transformation, uh, super translation that vanishes on S for any uh, cross section S2 and S1, such that S1 is in the future of S, and S2 is in the future of S1, the variation of the vial charge, uh, super translation charge for the York uh, charge is positive, and uh, the charge is positive in general. And uh, if uh, we normalize the killing, uh, the, so it's not a killing, sorry, the null deformism to be 2p times n, we see that we recover something that is very similar to the Dirichlet entropy, but uh, with now the same one over d minus two uh, correction uh, in front of the dynamical term. And now, rather than stating the theorem four, I will just give you the, show you the picture because I think it's more enlightening. If we use this new entropy for uh, a spherical symmetric collapse, because earlier with the, the, the first theorem, we restricted ourselves to uh, uh, surface uh, with the topology B times R, but we know that event horizons in general have caustics. This is the case even in the simplest case, which is the spherical symmetric collapse, where there is one caustic where the generators enter the horizons. You can prove that actually this entropy York vanishes on the light cone phase. This is the first stage of the collapse before that matter enters the horizons. Then some matter enters the horizon and then you can show that 
if matter H shears enter the origin, the, the variation of this charge is positive. And uh, at the end, the last, uh, last stage of the collapse, uh, it stabilizes to the value, uh, actual value A over 4G. So actually this, you know, when we show that the area is the entropy, it increases even at the beginning of the collapse when no matter has entered the horizon. While with this dynamical charge, it does not because its variation is given by the amount of matter and uh, the gravitational towards of freedom which propagate into the, the horizons. And uh, actually, there is a nice analogy with the uh, phase transition where uh, the other parameter is actually here, the expansions, because the expansions at the beginning is d minus 2, while it vanishes uh, on the stationary uh, event horizon. And uh, uh, this corresponds to an enlargement of the symmetry groups where we recover the super translations that were symmetries of the stationary black hole, uh, as uh, Hawking, Perry, Stominger was stating. And uh, so uh, I think I'm over time, so I just leave you with the summary and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for giving the last talk in this session and now we have some time for questions. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. So you applied that to uh, black holes. Could you also apply it to uh, the cosmological horizon, like in the sitter? No, I never, never thought about this. <laughs> the horizons, for now only on horizons. Thank you very much. Are there any more questions? Okay, I don't see. Ah, oh, sorry. sorry could, you, could you comment more on, on um, the York boundary condition versus the Dirichlet? Like, you know, um, yeah. when, when is like you fix the temperature and the one? Do you have a thermodynamical interpretation? Uh, here, I'm not really because uh, it's, uh, yeah, so I should precise, maybe I haven't said during uh, the talk, but uh, so for the urban air conditions, the configuration variables are the conformal matrix and, uh, the, uh, uh, and the expansions. And uh, yes, no, I don't, uh, it's very, uh, what, what happens actually that, uh, I didn't have the time to talk about this, but we see that it's, uh, when you have the Dirichlet entropy, you satisfy the first law locally, and when you have the your boundary conditions, you have an additional term, because it cannot satisfy, which is a kind of dynamical term that is proportional to the uh, area, uh, the product of the area at the expansion. I wanted to give at some point uh, the, the interpretation of this term as a, uh, a surface tension term, but uh, actually, uh, uh, I think it didn't work. Or so uh, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt you. Yeah. This was orders from uh, higher force. Uh, so let's postpone this discussion till uh, the coffee break after the discussion, uh, the roundtable discussion. And let's thank all the speakers in this session again for very nice and compact uh, talks. And I would like to invite you for the roundtable discussion, which will be the last event on this conference. Yes, thank so you. Please, uh, Go to CC2. Now.